Hey, what's up, everybody? This is the Notorious MJH. Um, yeah, that's the one good on the show. <laughs> hey, we have a great show lined up for you guys tonight. Um, once again, we have our co-host, Dolly Miller Brennan, and we have uh, back with us for the third time, actually, two times official, uh, Mr. Andrew Constant Newella. Constant Newella. I put a T in there. I didn't mean to. Uh, he was running for senator of the horniest state in America. Um, yeah, we'll get into that in a second. And um, before, okay, let me get let me get this out of the way. I have a great announcement to make. Um, this isn't necessarily about the tonight's topic, but it does lead into it because um, you guys know about Ning, and if uh, you know anything about me and Ning layouts and all that stuff, you know what happened with Ning um, wanting to go from free to premium where you have to pay to have sites on there. And I, uh, when I heard about that, um, I took a big step in and I said, you know what, you guys don't worry. I'm going to create something that you guys can use for free. It's going to have everything that Ning has and you're not going to have to worry about, you know, Ning charging $50 a site and, and all this. I've been working on it for months, and today I put up the last two features on that site, you know, where they're, where they're operable, which is events and um, groups. You know, we have all that in communication creation, and um, hosting is the only thing you guys got to pay for, and I had to change that because if I host the sites for you, and uh, I know most of you are responsible people, but if anybody does anything stupid, I'm responsible for it. So I'm not actually going to host it for you. But what I am going to do is provide the hosting for you where you can sign up for your own account and be responsible for that. And that is like as low as four ninety five a month. Not a big deal. The software itself, all you got to do is go to communicationcreations.com, and uh, this will be available in a day or two. I just got to polish it up and package it where you can download the zip file and upload it to your server, to your, uh, to your web hosting. And then all you got to do is, Set everything up like you did on Ning, you know, your, your themes and your features that you want and everything. And the first thing I did once I got the groups running, besides for the, the test groups, just to make sure it worked, was I created a group called Cast for Senate. And that's Mr. Constant Tuella, who's uh, on the phone with us now. Um, if you go to communicationcreations.com to sign up for an account, right there on the sign-up page, there's a, a checkbox. All you got to do is check that you want to join the group Cast for Senate and um, you automatically will be in the group once you submit your form. Um, I mentioned that Mr. Constant Newella is running for representation of Texas, which has been voted, according to Men's Health Magazine, the number one horniest state, well, actually the number one horniest city in America was, in, in, the, in their survey, which was, was put out today, was Austin, Texas. And Austin, I, I just looked at the website, um, which is... Hot 95.7, Houston's Hot Hits, they're really happy about this. They're, they're like, yeah, we're the horniest city in America, you know, and, yeah, they're, they're really, really happy. Our local station, actually here in Virginia Beach, we were voted number 55 on that poll. We were the 55th horniest city in America. And I, I just find that kind of ironic because our state slogan is Virginia is for lovers. <laughs> but then we were voted 55th as far as being horny. Don't really get that. But from that uh, FM 99, our local radio station here, I do have this clip I want to play, uh, just part of it. Um, the whole thing you can um, listen to yourself either on communicationcreations.com or on the radio's website, which is fm99.com. But I'm just going to play a part of this, just a little clip, because it's, it's like a little... We just call it random. This is Rick uh, is this a, It's a convenience store down in uh, Texas yeah. somewhere. Yeah. There we go. Good morning. Thank you for calling. Yeah, hi. Who's this? This is John. Hey, John. How's it going? Uh, uh, good. We were reading an article online, and it said that Austin, Texas, is the horniest city in America. <laughs> well, I wouldn't know about that. <laughs> uh, could you ask some of the customers if they're horny? <laughs> just take a minute. Uh, so what can I do for you this morning? I just want to know if you're horny. <laughs> <laughs> Who is it? Uh, a guy that's also horny. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Do, do we actually have any business? To, to Are you uncomfortable? Am I uncomfortable? Yeah, I don't mean to make you uncomfortable. I'm just horny. <laughs> well, that, that sounds like a personal problem that you need to. Yeah, that's why I was calling you down there. We're thinking about sending our intern down there. Uh, well, you could send your intern down here, but mm -hmm. uh, the only thing your intern's going to get is a really good slurpee. All right. Well, 
and you know what? That's obviously that's code. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the part I thought was funny. Slopey is code. <laughs> so, um, Dolly Miller Bryan, are you there? <laughs> I'm here. I'm here. I'm lucky to be here today. My internet was down. My cable, my phone, everything was down. Came up about 15 minutes ago. Wow, that was cutting it close. Yeah, it's yeah, well, short. Just before, I'm in Wisconsin just before right now. What's that? I said, I'm in Wisconsin right now, and they said there was an outage all over the state for the, for the, the provider that I have. You know, I forgot to look and see how uh, Wisconsin rated in that um, in that survey. <laughs> Wisconsin, oh. I'm not a native of Wisconsin, but Wisconsin's a big beer drinking state. That when I first that. came up here and I didn't know what bratwurst was, everybody said, oh, my gosh, I didn't know what a bratwurst was. Excuse me, uh, I've never it. <laughs> but you're originally from Texas, so you're originally yes, from sir. the horniest state in America. There you go. Oh, I definitely. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah Cass, Cass and I, were, right before you called in, uh, before the show started, we were, you know, well, I, I was saying, you know, I hope Dolly shows up. She does all the serious stuff. Um, you know, I, I'm just here for comedy relief. But, um, yeah, everybody, uh, Dolly Miller Brennan actually, you know, she just revamped this Blog Talk radio show that, that, you know, I used to do by myself. And she really is responsible for, you know, all the ideas and the guests that have been on here lately. So, um, thank you, Dolly, for that. And, um, Cass, you know, I, I just have the idea, um, you know, maybe, uh, like for a, for a campaign slogan, <laughs> you could, um, you could go, come. Cass for Senate, are you horny? <laughs> well, you know, well, you know, is, uh, you know if the girl in Delaware would have ran with that slogan, you know, they might not be on her case like they are right now. <laughs> well, you got to remember, Austin does have long horns, and, and you know, you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they do. How about that? <laughs> like I was saying, is it? We try to do our part to help the economy, you know, with the, uh, you know, all the sales that were done in those um, adult toys, so to speak, according to the survey, but. Uh, you know, got to make some money, I guess, and that's that's one way to kind of kind of help out the economy by helping some industry that uh, I wouldn't say is the greatest, but hey. Well, yeah, I, I guess the sex toy industry is uh, doing pretty well right now, even in this economy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, well, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> I think Texas is doing it, it's one, it's doing better than most states, I think, with employment. Oh yeah. Yes, yes, yes. I, 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 I agree. I mean, you know, we, we're we're doing a really good job of of trying to keep the unemployment rate down. Um, and uh, and I got to commend once again, like I did in previous shows, it goes back to uh, to some of our laws that we have in place and in reference to kind of make that happen. Uh, and that's that's the way it's got to be. I mean, it just goes back to that Tenth Amendment state sovereignty. You got to got to empower the people. In in this case, is the people are the state governments. That's the way it's going to happen. Well, Kat, uh, Andrew, I was noticing that we were, you know, going to discuss a little bit about uh, the Arizona uh, State Bill 1070. I wonder if you could tell us a little about that. Well, you know, it's it's a very, <laughs> it's one of probably the controversial issues that goes hand in hand with, uh, with the illegal immigration and securing the border and immigration reform. And, you know, there's so many different venues that it goes through that uh, I'm actually in the process of putting my uh, my my illegal immigration pro- uh, proposal together as a point paper on my website on Casper Senate on Facebook, and then once I get that done, I'm going to go ahead and post it on my CasperSenate.com w- uh, web page. In reference to, and this is going to be more pos- my position on the Arizona bill. And I first and foremost, that I always say is that people have to understand something about me, and that is that I'm a very big constitutional advocate. Uh, I strongly believe in the United States Constitution. Uh, When we are talking about the rule of law, we we have to understand the first rule of law is the United States Constitution. I mean, there's, there's, there's just really no way around that. It sets the tone for, you know, the separation between, you know, federalism and state sovereignty, and then goes on down to the other venues. Um, so I'm a big constitutional advocate. Uh, I've spent, like I said, 20 years, and even if you go on my website, you probably see an old picture of me holding up my right hand in my uniform saying, you know, I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. 
and I, and I firmly believe that. I, I mean, it's true to my heart, uh, and we have to understand that when we take that oath, that, that is, that's the most important oath that we can have, you know, in reference to that. With that said, as I look at the Arizona bill, and then it, and it frustrates me to to see how our federal government has not done what it's constitutionally supposed to be doing. You know, it is up to the, to the federal government and its agencies, as well as its, its legislatures, to enforce federal law. You know, that's why we com- the, com- created the Department of Homeland Security, or I should merge it, I should say. But you have ICE and you have Border Security, you have Immigration Reform, you have Naturalization, everything and all, as many other agencies fall under the Department of Homeland Security. And it's their job to enforce it. So when you got a state like Arizona and many others, they get frustrated because somebody's not doing their job. And as many times that I've been in, in positions of leadership, and thus it's more frustrating when somebody does not do their part to make everything else run smoothly. So when you look at, you know, Governor Brewer and how she kind of got frustrated and wanted to put something into play, and, and then you have the creation of Arizona Bill 1070. Um, so you well, can't I was re- noticing, Go ahead. I was noticing, I, I was just researching, and I found out, that, and I wanted to know what your opinion was on this, because you had just said, you know, it's the federal government's responsibility, mm-hmm. and they weren't, you know... Uh, you know, uh, they weren't taking ownership of that. Now, mm-hmm. I discovered that in President Hoover, during the Depression, he mm-hmm. deported all illegal aliens in order to make jobs available to Americans. Harry Truman deported 2 million after World War II to create jobs for returning veterans. And in 1954, Dwight Eisenhower deported 13 million uh, to make jobs for Korean and World War II veterans. Now, is that upholding is that the federal government taking responsibility you know i just was anxious to get your opinion on that well when we look at here's the big question when we look at illegal or let me phrase it immigration uh enforcement the united states always have has had some type of immigration enforcement you know from the chinese uh immigration act that was created and it was basically saying we're going to have certain chinese that are going to come over and they're going to work on our railroads and then once they're done, they're going to go back, okay? And or we're not going to let going to let certain um, immigrants come over, and they're going to stay, and the rest got to go back. So we've always had some form of act in play that's going to be singling out some form of immigration. I mean, it's kind of like the uh, Operation Wetback in 1950s, and that, that was, was Operation idea. Wetback. Yeah, that's, that's what they called it which was when the United States kind of got too many illegal immigrants, or in this place it was focused on Hispanics, it went out deporting a whole bunch of, or mass deportation of a bunch of Hispanics. As well as, you know, the you end up going back to the zoot suit rights back in the 1930s, uh, you know, in California. You know, there's, there's always been some form of uh, federal intervention when it came to I- illegal immigration, but it was usually the federal government that kind of came in and stepped in and did that. Now, whether we like those 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 programs or not, it was the federal government who was doing that, which brings me back to the Constitution. You know, I I support any governor, Republican or Democrat, who's going to stand up to the federal government and say, "Hey, look, enough is enough." You know, that's one thing I'm going to say about Rick Perry. You know, he he puts his foot down with with the federal government, whether it has to do with their unemployment stimulus package. He's saying, "No, we don't want your stimulus money because you got strings attached to it." Because you want me to pay part-time unemployment, uh, unemployment to part-time workers who didn't pay into the system, so he says no. Or he says to you know the education department and their stimulus money says no, we don't want it because you you're tying our hands on how we are able to use that for education. As a matter of fact, talk about something unconstitutional, where Congress singles out the state of Texas alone that they have to do special requirements in order to get this stimulus uh, education money. Now, where is that uniform in the Constitution? You know so. Any governor, Republican or Democrat, that stands up to the federal government and says, "Hey, look, you know, enough is enough. We need to we need to stump your your dug on BS that you're kind of shoving down us, and we got to stand up for our rights." So you know that's from that perspective. But also, at the same time, I look at the the law itself, and and even though I I, I support the spirit and intent of the people of Arizona and the legislative of Arizona as well as any others that are taking it up. 
the law, unfortunately, is unconstitutional. When you look at Section 1, or Article 1, Section 8 of the United States Constitution, it specifically states, I'm going to look right here because I looked up in Cornell Law, and that states that, right here, that the Congress has the ability to establish a uniform rule of naturalization and uniform laws on the subject of bank records throughout the United States. That means Congress is the only one, unfortunately, right now that can make that happen. They're the only ones that can pass the laws, just kind of like they did back in the, you know, the Chinese uh, uh, Immigration Act or, or the others that got passed throughout, throughout our, our history. And then people who want to use the Tenth Amendment say, well, look, we, we, we want to invoke our Tenth Amendment rights. Well, then you have to look at the Tenth Amendment, and that basically states that unless... If, if it states in the Constitution it belongs to the federal government, then I'm sorry, it belongs to the federal government. That doesn't mean that I'm saying that we, we should not do anything. I am a very strong support that we really need to do something with immigration reform. I'm very big on, on enforcing our, our borders. I'm, I'm big on not on amnesty, to be honest with you. I don't, I don't support amnesty. We need to make a stand. Don't get me wrong, but we're going to have to use the venues of our checks and balances system in the Constitution. And if that even means that we have to get a constitutional convention, which would be an awesome idea, if you get two-thirds of the states that say, you know what, Congress, we're tired of you trying to trying to, trying to jack us around, well, we're going to get our, our, our two-thirds of our state together, we're going to call a constitutional convention, and we're going to make you now address the issues, what we, what we want to do, because that is in our constitutional right. And if we want to amend the Constitution, then we have the right to do that. So that those are the venues to try to use in order to make change happen, uh, versus getting totally emotionally out of you know burst into you know frustration and anger and, and you know and doing the things that you know pretty much could create you know violence. And there's, but there's venues that that's the beauty of the Constitution. Use the venue. And, and a good example of that why I say that is it goes back to Delaware because I was reading an article. And, and people were saying, well, the Republican Party's all split up. There's no leadership. There's no nothing because, you know, uh, of what happened in Delaware. And I'm saying, you're, not, you're missing the point. You don't realize who's in charge of the Republican Party, and that is the people, because the people themselves have spoken. And the same thing could be done in every venue of immigration reform to other issues and, and you know, electing people who aren't representing them. Don't, if they're not representing them, don't, get them, don't, don't elect them. Does that kind of wrap up things a little bit? Or? Can you hear me? Yeah, I got you. Okay, I lost you. And I'm on another line. All of a sudden, you were gone. <laughs> I lost you. I tell you, I've been having, you know, connection problems today. Uh, you know, I think serious. that was actually my fault, Dolly. I accidentally muted you for a second because I'm uh-huh. having connection problems myself. Um, what was we'll you were talking about? Um, I'm sorry, not to stray away from the issues here, Cash. Uh-huh. But um, what were you saying, Dolly, about, you know, you had an Internet down, down out or something? I have charter. Maybe I shouldn't say that, but I was so frustrated today, and I'm, right now I'm in Wisconsin, and the entire state had an outage. You know, there's no TV, no Internet. I had no landline. I mean, I have a Google phone also, but I had no charter landline. And, um, in fact, it even, because I work off of the Google phone, it even – Affected that, you Are know. You talking about so, Google Voice. Um, well, I work off of my de- my other in my computer room. I work off of my desktop, and I have a special phone for that computer. And you really don't need the other connection, but it even affected that. Yeah, I have Google Voice over, it, and it even affected that. Yeah, that's so, what I've been using. I like that. I just had we had serious serious connection problems here today. Now, well, the, past, have, the past few days, I mean, the internet's been slow here, but I thought it was the network I'm on. And, you know, I'm I'm, get, I'm having problems right now just um, pulling up the switchboard. That's how I accidentally muted you. I don't even know how I muted you. I had to switch screens because uh, one went no, blank. My phone went completely dead. I think it was I think it was me. <laughs> okay. Uh, no. Well, yeah, now, I time. was yeah, pulling up something in the post today. Where, where did I get this from again? In the post today, and it was the Washington Post. Sometimes I like to look at that because it is—it's not conservative friendly to an extent. Oh, if it's in there, 
you know, in some instances, you know, and, and they were talking about how, and Cass, I wonder what you felt about this, about how um, the Repub- how the Tea Party may not be good for the Republican Party. What are your opinions on that? You see, that's my fear, though, that because I think they, there's an intention to create a division, and I'm not to say that there's not there's not there's not a I don't want to say division, but there's some some concern about let's just say the Republican Party and which direction it wants to go, and it, and it goes back to some of the old Storm and Norman kind of thing of informing in reference to group dynamics and, and, and organizations along those lines. So you know, to say that the the Tea Party is is is, is it's a part, actually, of the Republican Party, and actually, it's even, I, I, I kind of even, I, I guess I have a hard time accepting because I actually see the Tea Party is neither part of, really, the Republican Party or even the Democratic Party. It's part of the American Party. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, you know, that could very well be. I... You still there? Oh, I think I might have lost uh, I noticed, um, uh, I'm a big fan of Carl Rove, and last night, he was discussing that also in regard to um, in regard to the Tea Party and, you know, talking on Hannity, and he was discussing, he didn't know if this was a good thing. He didn't know if this was trusted. Well, and, and, I, and I can understand because whenever you – in change, when you're looking at, at, at the stages of change and what happens in an individual or in a process, you know, you, you have that what we call the pre-contemplation stage, which is basically – Oh, there's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong. We don't have to do anything. And then all of a sudden you have that contemplation stage where basically is, you know what, maybe we need to kind of take a look at something here a little bit. You know, and that might have been, you know, when one Tea Party won an election here or, or something along the lines, and, and then you say, okay, well, all right, whatever. Then all of a sudden you're going to go from the contemplation to the preparation stage and say, okay, change is definitely coming. And either we have one or two options. Either we take, which is the next stage, action, or we don't do anything and we go backwards. Okay, and I think that's where, you know, the uh, when we're looking at the the Republican Party is going through that process right now because you you were, were very comfortable with one system kind of working its way through you know through the history of our nation, and all of a sudden, oops, guess what? Things are changing here, and 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 especially if you have no control over the outcome, like you had in Delaware, then all of a sudden it throws everything off. Say, well, how do we how do we how do we maintain uh, control, or even whether that's through le- controlling the legislation that gets presented before you know Congress, or how do we control, you know, how things are going to get uh, you know rules or passed and stuff like that. So it, it's going to create a little anxiety, and and that's and that's perfectly natural. And I think a good example of that was you have a we have a tendency to have a, a knee jerk reaction, okay, which is our initial gut response. You know that's why I'm always reluctant to kind of you know respond to legal immigration until I really put my 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 full force behind it. Okay, now this is where I'm going to put my boots on the ground, and and this is where I'm going to stand on, until I look at everything more appropriately, and that's what we had with the Delaware situation with Christine O'Donnell winning the Republican nomination. Was that initially had a, a, a gut reaction by someone uh, we would call the old guards who were used to you know process working a certain way, and they're saying, uh, oh no, heck no, we're not going to put up with that. No, we're we're not going to do that. But then again, you find later that Senator, Corn- Senator Cornyn and others and say, okay, now we're going to support, you know, Christine O'Donnell as, as a Republican nominee for the state of Delaware. And that's actually what the people are wanting. They want they want to leave and say, okay, yes, we understand this is kind of crazy for you, but understand this is our government. This is our Constitution, and this is what we want. We have spoken. We didn't speak to you Republicans. We didn't speak to the Democrats. We spoke to everybody in government saying, we want to start a new direction. We want our principles and our values back. And that, that's basically what, what the vote, in my opinion, basically stated. stated. It wasn't towards Republicans, even though it was a Republican primary, but it's more important to the Democrats who are sitting in, 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 in Washington saying, oh, heck, you know, <laughs> That means if they voted that many for that many people voted for her on the Republican primary against a veteran, and I'm not a military veteran, I'm talking more of a, a political veteran. Gosh Almighty, what does that mean is going to happen in the rest of the state? Well, and I understand her incumbents out of there, and I understand her position in getting the incumbents out, and I understand the concept of you know discussing issues here, but there there's more at stake than that too. I didn't hear her discussing any type of, as you have done, 
any type of opinions on foreign policy. I didn't hear her trying to follow her, didn't hear her discussing any of that. And Carl Rogba said she was less than forthcoming about certain things. So mm-hmm. I didn't think that that bode well for the Tea Party or the Republican Party. Well, it, it, and that's because that's the metric sometimes we use, to, to I, I think, to some degree, to litmus test of somebody to see whether they do or they don't. And the reality is, there's two things I kind of always think about, especially myself running for this position, is that, number one, when this country was starting, what was George Washington, was uh, Alexander Hamilton, uh, was Thomas Jefferson, was John Adams, you know, James Monroe, were these people professional politicians, or were they just normal citizens, just like you and I, who decided to put a union together, write a Declaration of Independence, pass a Constitution, and make a Bill of Rights? What I find interesting is they didn't go through the public school system. They never would have achieved what they did, you know. I, I look at the public school system almost as detrimental to our to our children's education sometimes. <laughs> now on another on another uh in, in another area today, Hamas used phosphor shells today in attacking Israel. So they've got mm-hmm. you know, I mean, there is a new weapon here. Mm-hmm. And uh, where the Palestinians had said Abbas had said he didn't want any any uh, blood, you know, spilled, no matter whose blood it was today, or mm-hmm. whose blood it was. Let me pull this up here. It wasn't Deb? Uh, what, what kind of uh, um, Hamas, uh, Abbas, and then the, uh, the PA had said he didn't want anybody's blood shed. It didn't matter whose it was. Palestinians no, no, no. Or, what kind of shells did you say? Uh, phosphorus shells. Uh, what, what, what is that? Uh, phosphorus shell, I think, actually, they were used in El Salvador, and that was kind of my area of study when I was getting my degree, Central American Revolutionary Government, and El Salvador and the phosphorus shells, and I, I, I believe, I'm not sure, but I believe they have a napalm center, and, and Cass would probably know more about that than I would. Mm. No, I, I can't say I've studied that specifically on the, on the shells of phosphorus in, in reference to that, uh, but it's definitely something I would look into. I mean, I was aware that they did the, the attack uh, in reference to that, and and it's you know I was reading an article, and I'll, I'll go ahead and share this with you because it's pretty interesting. And whether it's true or not, you know, the, the source of cited was some general person back in I think it's in World War One, and I don't know, and it kind of said like it was. It was during uh, the Philippines or something like that, and I didn't know if he was there or not. But anyway, the article went on to explain that, you know, he was having problems with terrorist organizations uh, that were down there. And, you know, they were constantly attacking and attacking and like, attacking. So you finally, supposedly, according to this article, end up, uh, you know, capturing some terrorists. And then, of course, I guess they were going to eventually line them up, I guess, for execution or something like that. And it, it's interesting the perspective he took. Not that I would say I would recommend this, but, you know, he ended up bringing in a bunch of uh, pigs in front of him because I guess they were a Muslim uh, of faith or something. I'm not sure. And then he slaughtered the pigs in front of him, and then he ended up dipping the, the shells and, and the ammo that he was going to use for uh, for the execution into the blood of the pig. And then I guess he must have carried out the execution, and it, he didn't have any more. Uh, he didn't have any more terrorist attacks coming on his organization or on his area. And I mean, there's something to be said for that, <laughs> to a certain degree. You know, I mean, I can remember during Operation Desert Storm, and I was not a fan of Operation Desert, Desert Storm. And I remember getting into a discussion at, with um, I forget who he was now. He was at. Uh, uh, right, I think it was in Houston, and that time I was working for a private individual. I don't think they liked him or me very well. And um, uh, discussing it with him, and he was an expert in international law, he said it may not be ethical and it may not be right, but certain actions are not illegal and cannot be prosecuted. Mm-hmm. Oh, well, and the thing was, is because according to some faiths, you know, they, you know, like for instance, the Muslims who think pork is dirty and stuff like that, and, and they figured that. You know, I guess if you executed them with, you know, the, the blood of a, of a of a pig, then I guess they weren't going to get into their their paradise, so to speak. Uh, oh, and, that makes sense. So then, therefore, you know, they were thinking, well, you know, this could end up hurting us uh, in the long run. But uh, 
So they don't get the 72 virgins. Oh, no, they changed that. There's not 72 virgins anymore. It came out last night. There's 2.5 million because there are 500 waiting at 5,000 stations waiting for the martyrs to come through. So now, uh, okay. now there are 2.5 million. Uh, now, now what, what if these martyrs, they die and, and then they, you know, you know what, what, they, what they believe is actually true, except all these virgins aren't female, they're male virgins. <laughs> Well, you know, they actually do. I studied the Quran, and, and, and I studied Islam, because that was another one of my areas, religious philosophy. And they honestly do have a belief that there are going to be virgins waiting there for them. Hmm. Well, I think if we're really looking, you know, a lot of the, the wars we've engaged over the time is, you know, they've, they've been driven by some some form of uh, of religiosity, so to speak. You know, when we even look at, to some degree, even our Revolutionary War here in the United States, you know, not only wasn't it free from the British, but also, you know, maybe freedom of religion to be able to practice their own religion. Yeah, I find uh, it interesting when you said freedom of religion. Now they're looking at freedom from religion. <laughs> and the 13 colonies each had their own state religion. Mm-hmm. You know, so there wasn't a freedom. There was a freedom of religion, the freedom to have whatever religion you wanted. But now it's the freedom from, you know, they want mm-hmm. to take it away from everybody. Back, back when they had the 13 colonies, there was no freedom from religion. You still had to go to church. You got put in the stockade for a week. That's right. There was a, there was freedom of religion to practice your religion, but there was, yeah, you're exactly right, but there was a state religion for each state. And, well, I suppose that's getting off the topic a little bit today, but uh, what um, Abbas had said, you know, what did Abbas say? He, Abbas say, he said uh, he condemned, he didn't want any blood to be shed, not one drop on the part. Uh, from the Israelis or the Palestinians. However, uh, and I want to cast his opinion on this today. And there was another statement that came out. Uh, Mohammed Dahlan, who is, you know, a senior PA official, mm-hmm. he says the violence is our right. It's our legal right. The international community affirms it for us. That I find dangerous. Affirms it for us. But it's the responsibility of the leadership to use it when it wants. It is at the proper place and the proper time, and the responsibility of the PA leadership to understand that the killing of Israelis must be timed just right. Well, that would kind of freak me out a little bit, especially when, when it came out. You know, if you you know you read this fine print here, and when it came out and, you know, when he, when he came out and said that uh, rather than condemning terror, he came out and said the international community affirms that they have the right to do that. That's why you need a strong senator in office, someone that, that understands this. That's why I was a little concerned with the Christine McDonald win. Does she understand this? Can she handle this? Well, I, I won't, you know, it goes back. I really couldn't answer that question. It would be more speculation on, on the part. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have – this goes back to my faith. I'm going to have faith that evidently she does or she should be able to handle it. Um, you know, it, it's easier to knock somebody down than it is to – to kind of help them along the way. Either uh, knock them down is to raise them up. <laughs> yeah, because, you know, once you knock them down, then you can say, okay, now I'm the one that's right because you're down looking up at, you're looking at me. It, it's more difficult to, to give a pull-up uh, in this situation. And I think that's, uh, you know, i, I got to have faith. If we don't have, I mean, faith in, in a, actually even faith in the people of the state of Delaware because they're the ones that made the choice, you know. They're they're the ones that vested her. They're the ones that did her, you know the research. They're the ones that made the decision, saying, "Look, this is the person we want to put in our office." And you you're know. certainly right about that. Not being a career politician in some senses. I mean, I don't think Harry Truman was a career politician when he got into office. Mm-hmm. We're and that's and that's Christine McDonald on the on the show here. <laughs> Pardon? So we're gonna to to try and get this Christine McDonald on the show here, and you know, we like, should we should do that. You know. yes. Yeah, and, that's a good idea. And, and get Gisela Mead so that she can give a perspective on Muslims. I did get an email from her today, and she told me to call her. And I want to introduce both of you to her when, when we can get on here, and I think that oh, she might well. be a valuable ally for you, Cass, in the Senate, and for mm-hmm. you, Mike, because she had, she's just so active. Um, and she's a, an Iraqi Muslim girl that spoke out against the mullahs. and, and mm-hmm. Iraqi Iranian. 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 Iranian, I'm sorry. She was in Iraq. It was, you know, she was there. She lived in both countries, you know. 
And yeah, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure I saw an episode on the 700 Club about her. I'm sure you did. She. It sounds very, very familiar. She's a, a real. She's a real sweet girl. You know. So you think that uh, you think that the that the bill uh, 1070 in Arizona. You think that's constitutionally correct? Is that right, Cal? No, I, I'm, I'm actually going the other direction. <laughs> Unfortunately, it's unconstitutional because it violates Section One, Article One, Section Eight of the U.S. Constitution, uh, where the federal government has the right to make rules on, on naturalization, and that's where okay. it falls into. Well, that's falls where in. you're saying that it violates yeah. that, and you're saying that because the federal government isn't picking up the ball, they're becoming frustrated and saying we have to protect ourselves. Exactly. We're having people coming in and murdering ranchers right out, in, you know, right out in the open. Hmm. Yeah, there's a, there's a there's a lot of lot of stuff going on. I don't know whether I shared with you. I have a family member that worked for the Department of Interior, and of course his biggest concern was that he, you know, he works right there on the on the border as well. But uh, you know, he was saying that uh, you know a lot of, uh, in his opinion, was the fear was driven by you know the fact that you, they want to make. A, a, the United States to feel uncomfortable with the fact that hey, you got a border problem, you got drugs coming over, you got gangs coming over, you got people dying on the border. And he's saying, you know what, we really don't see a lot of that out here, in, you know, in this part of the, uh, the border in Texas. Uh, he says a lot of that's really driven by <laughs> Department of Homeland Security to try to make it look like there's a there's a significant problem, so that way they can kind of go ahead and, and, and increase their funding and, and and create their own little uh, militia or whatever it may be. And this is a Democrat talking, by the way, and not a Republican. Uh, well, Cass, uh, they're, they're in Texas. I mean, do, do you have that, those types of problems with the, with the border, you know, people coming across the Rio Grande and, you know, shooting up? You well, you know, know there, was, there was an article here a while back in south uh, southwest Texas down on the, the, uh, the, I want to say the Brownsville, Laredo side, somewhere between there, that there was an uh, allegation that some gangs came across and, and, and shot a Texas rancher. And a newspaper guy went and investigated it, and he went with the FBI, and he went with the local sheriffs, he went with the police station, you know, trying to find out if this did happen. And, and it turned out to be a false claim uh, that it didn't happen. Uh, so, you know, it's very interesting that what does. Now, I'm not going to say that it that it it will, it cannot happen or it has not happened, because I do think it's just kind of like you can watch the news, and all of a sudden you can see something on the news, something very devastating it, and sometimes it kind of frustrates me because we'll focus on one negative thing that happened in, in Florida or, or Oregon or someplace and say some girl got killed by so-and-so and, and this and that, and, and it goes all over the United States. And, 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 and it becomes a major issue, you know. But the reality is that there's a, there's a lot of crime all over the United States. But if we focus on that one area between the borders or what's happening on the borders and we find one person who ends up, uh, you know, getting beheaded, and I, and I do believe beheading is happening, but it's happening on the Mexican side, not on the American side. Uh, I have a strong, you know, one of, the, one of the positions is on illegal immigration. So I do support that the National Guard does be did get put on the border uh, in reference to that, you know, to protect our, our borders from somebody you know, who's coming across or, or causing crimes or something like that. That goes back to my own military days. you got to protect your own. Um, and then there so, was a comment, too, on the news regarding um, Mr. Obama considering um, pro- considering a proposal to allow illegal aliens to vote. If they're in this country and they haven't engaged in criminal activities, they have to register to vote, but they have to allow them to vote. Now, what concerns me is I don't know of another country in this entire world that allows an illegal alien to vote or would even consider a proposal. Another gem out of Obama's mouth. Why yeah. are you even concerned about that when we have real issues going on? Well, and he's try- I think he's trying to appease to the Hispanic population, but he don't realize that. And here's the thing that might surprise so many people is that his- a majority of Hispanics, believe it or not, do want immigration reform. And, and they do want something done with the border. And then a lot of them don't really support a lot of amnesty programs. And that's why it kind of, you know, you see yourself, like, somebody like myself who's running as a conservative on the Republican Party, and you have somebody like Senator Reid saying, I don't know how a Hispanic could be a conservative or a Republican. Well, that's because you just don't know Hispanics then. Well, um, it's hey. like my dear, one of my dearest, dearest friends, and she's been in this country since the uh, – well, since probably the 60s, 
And uh, she immigrated to this country. Her sister was here. She got her, you know, she got her citizenship, her degree, yada, yada. She's from Mexico. And she said, this is like a slap in the face to me. You know, she said, I came here. She said, I learned the language. She said, I, you know, I, I became a citizen. She said, I married a patriot. And she says, now they're saying that you don't have to do that. Everything I work for, I shouldn't have had to work for. Everybody else can have it for free. So mm-hmm. she considers that to be a slap in her face. So like you're saying, all Hispanics don't agree with it. No, they don't, and and that's and I, I myself I don't agree with that. If you know Obama's trying to trying to pass that, and and you know, and I and I was reading actually an article where he's trying to circumvent Congress and and trying to use it through through some type of executive order or, or memorandum right. through you know Department of Homeland Security. And, and my first thought is, okay, at what point did and if I was you know a senator or, or a House of Representative, I'd be asked the question: When did I give you my legislative authority? To just make your rules as you want them to. I passed a law, and this law said this is what it is. And here you are, you're promulgating something that's totally uh, has, has no spirit and intent on what I passed. You know, and that, that that's where I, you know, we, you know, you get people in Congress right now, and especially with November coming around, and you gotta, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta implement the checks and balances system within our constitution. Well, it's it's just scary. I, I can't think of another country in the world that even consider this. I mean, if you go into Iran, you try to vote, you know, they shoot you or hang you or, or whatever. If you go into other countries, the least you're going to do is be imprisoned. And France just unanimously passed a ban on the burqa because I know in Houston you walk around the Galleria, you know, and we're walking around and I'm up on the second or third, anyway, whatever floor, and there are women going by in burqas. We think they're women. You don't know what's under those burqas. Sure. You just mm-hmm. don't know. And France unanimously passed the ban against the burqa, saying that you don't know who is underneath that burqa. You don't know if they have a bomb attached to them. You don't know what it is. And then here they were saying, we want to wear the burqa when we have our driver's license picture taken. They won't even let me wear sunglasses. You know, yeah, I well, mean, exactly. it's to identify you. We all need yeah, to well, be identified. Around here, you can't go in a public building without, like, a ski mask or anything, but, you know, that includes, you know, anything that covers your face. You know, you have to be able to see your face. That's right. And that, that's how they do it in Virginia. They don't, they don't, um, you know, segregate a uh, religion or, 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 or any type of um, ritual or, you know, anything people do, but you can't walk into a 7-Eleven and have any type of covering on your face. You can wear sunglasses, I guess. But, you know, if, if you can't see your face where they can see your identity, if you do something wrong, they can't identify you on the cameras. We don't let that happen. And, well, that's exactly right. You can't have your driver's license picture taken, you know, with something like that on. You know, when you take your no, driver's license. They, they tell me to take my ball cap off when I take pictures like that. You yeah, know? I was going to have my sunglasses on, and <laughs> she said, you have to take them off. I said, ma'am, they're prescription glasses. Well, I don't care. You can't wear them in here, you know. So, um <laughs> I, I think this is something we need to consider, too. You know, as Cass says, we need to defend ourselves and protect ourselves. And I don't well, yeah, think we're we, doing it. We definitely it. do. We definitely need to, you know, um, you, you know, it's, it's just how, okay, well, my first question here is why is Obama even worried about letting people who don't live in, uh, okay, it, it's, it's, you know, it's not segregation or anything. If you're not, if you weren't born here or you're not a citizen, not naturalized or, you know, whatever, you, you can't vote here. You know, uh, so why is why is this even an issue with Obama? Oh, create uh, you know, I, and that, and I really it's more speculation than anything else. Is I mean, it, it creates a, a, a diversion, maybe. <laughs> I mean, that's the best tactical move I would end up looking at it because if as we're sitting here talking about it, what is he really trying to pass? <laughs> he's maybe he's just trying to get votes. He's doing something else with his right hand. That's how Obama is. <laughs> and that's actually I mean, that's speculation, but you know. well, it's speculation. I think that's just the way the government kind of has been run, and why the people kind of start getting tired of it because you know they're doing. You know, you pass a bill one way, and then you tag on all these amendments and and, and everything else to it. That you know, these writers are just kind of just just messing it all up. But uh, you know, oh, and of course. Of I think has to do with saying, well, I want to appeal to the Hispanic population. Well, you know, uh, I have a hard time accepting that because, you know, there's a lot of legal Hispanics who've migrated to this country through the legal process. Not just even Hispanics. Let's just talk about all legal immigrants who migrated to this country. 
they did it the right way. They earned their right for citizenship, and you're just going to hand it out like candy to somebody else. I, I don't think that's going to fly. And Harry yeah, Reid is cool. trying to tack an amnesty uh, provision onto the defense bill. Mm-hmm. He's trying to quietly tack that on. And what's he doing with Lady Gaga? <laughs> oh, I have you heard that? that? Look, I heard Lady Gaga was born with a penis. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what I heard. Uh, well, she and Harry Reid have struck up a friendship, I guess, so. Which kind of grossed me out. I, I, Sorry about I, that. I have no comment on that one because I. <laughs> <laughs> no, but the amnesty bill, that's another question, Cass, because going into the Senate, you know, you would be privy to this type of information. Mm -hmm. What do you think of senators that try to tack on something they want onto a different bill because they know that the other bill passes, they'll get what they want, and you don't want anyone to know it, you know, attacking an amnesty bill onto the defense bill? Well, and I'm, and I'm totally against it, to be honest with you. It's crazy. Uh, and the thing is, they, they put it on the defense bill, and here I am, just to say I'm, uh, here I am in the United States Senate, and I got this defense bill sitting on me, and I want to support my troops because they need my support, and they need everything they can get from me. And then out here I see this little amendment that says, okay, we're going to attach, uh, you know, some other bill to it that's going to cause cost so much money for this or that. And I'm thinking, you know what, if I vote no, then you're going to go around telling everybody that I'm against the troops and I didn't support our troops and stuff like that, which is, you know, a, a big lie. But if I vote for yes, then you can come back and say, well, but look, you also voted for this as well. That's why I, I kind of prefer what we call line item veto, where the president is able to say, okay, boom, scratch this off, scratch this off. I'm vetoing this. I'm passing the bill, but I'm lining this item out because it does not fly with me. Uh, Isn't that we should call it your march or something like that when they do that? Right. Mm -hmm. And what about, could there be the possibility, the potential for, you can have earmarks, but they have to be directly related to the subject of the bill. It's like, uh, attacking an earmark on for uh, for uh, amnesty onto a defense bill doesn't make any mm -hmm. sense. So if they ha if they subjected them to being you know you know related to the bill on that topic, would that be helpful, Cass, or is that a possibility? No, I th I, th I think that's how it kind of starts. Unfortunately, because I could I could probably sell you that bill if if I wanted to, saying how there's a correlation, and that's saying well okay, defense. Uh, we're talking about security. We're talking about, you know, uh, getting people to defend our nation. Amnesty. Oh, okay. Well, doesn't that have to do with security? Securing our borders or something along those lines? <laughs> I see what you're saying. <laughs> and so they'll manipulate it to where it kind of makes it sound like it's part of the bill, and it gets thrown on there. Uh, whether that does or doesn't happen now. And I think there's got to be some, every bill should stand on its own. Uh, and just get rid of earmarks completely, not exactly. allow them? Exactly. Just, just, if you want an earmark, vote for an earmark. If you want to vote for, you know, the, uh, you know, I ain't going to mention that one that I just read, but another one that has to do, you know, with, you know, measuring the, the ice caps and the North Pole and how much they've kind of broken down, present it before us so we can fund it. And if we, if we fund it, we approve it. If we don't, good luck. It doesn't go through. And not tack it on to a major bill where the Negative. general public no, simply no. doesn't know what's exactly. going on. Exactly. You know, but I wonder if any of the Senate, even half of them, even read it and know it. <laughs> well, when you throw it in a two or 3,000 page bill, there's heck no, they're not going to read it. And you look to your staff aides to kind That's of do it. That's what I was just thinking, because they show those books. You know, when you watch C SPAN and stuff like that, they show those books and they're like six feet thick. Mm hmm. It's just, you know. I mean, just your average of everyday American citizen, we're not going to read all that. You know, we rely on you to tell us what's in it. We rely on you to vote for us, you know, or, you know, represent us when you vote. And that's why, you know, I, and, and sitting in the United States, in, in Washington, D.C., and and then there's a bill coming through my desk and, and or on my desk, and it's 6,000 pages long. And, you know, I, don't, I have no reason to campaign or whatever. I don't have to go make speeches around the United States. I have a, I have a job to do. So guess what I'm going to sit down and do with me and my uh, my aides and I? We're going to go through this doggone bill, and we're going to figure out exactly what it is. And, and it, but it'd be a lot easier if we didn't have any earmarks on it, because that wouldn't be six thick, six inches thick then. Well, the amnesty bill in particular I look at because of some of my friends, and also this other good friend of mine, Gazelle, she was seriously under threat, speaking out against the Mullahs, had death warrants out against her. 
her brother was sent to kill her. She had an extremely difficult time getting into the United States. Mm-hmm. This girl was not a terrorist. She was fleeing from them. She had an extremely difficult time getting in here. And yet, we're going to allow amnesty for other people. And she had to fight, literally fight. And then she was in Canada. And the judge told her, you know, you're safe here. You probably wise not to go to the United States. Then her brother moved to Canada. Mm-hmm. So she, you know, being chased around the world, and she mm-hmm. had to fight to get in here, and yet we're going to allow someone that doesn't have that type of struggle going on in their life, you know, to just get amnesty. And that's where it gets so murky because all all that gets, you know, kind of thrown in a frying pan. You know, we throw it all together, you know, between, you know, every special circumstance, and then we stick it in front of a judge who's going to end up deciding that case if he ever gets around to it to determine whether that individual does or doesn't deserve to get, uh, you know, American citizenship or even amnesty from that perspective. Uh, it, it's Amnesty is, gosh, Mariana, you know, it's interesting because, you know, if you, for instance, like if, uh, at least when I'm read or heard even from uh, somebody like from Cuba coming from Castro and they put foot on, on Florida, you know, they're going to claim amnesty uh, or asylum and, you know, they're more than likely going to get it because they come from a communist country. But if you're coming from some other one, they're going to say, oh, hold on, we've got to change the rules here a little bit. Uh, it's, it's just, and that's what goes back to immigration reform. Our immigration laws are just so so screwed up that we, we really need to kind of just... Well, Fidel is really mellowing out. He, you know, <laughs> he said that, um, he said the health care bill in this country, he said he didn't think it would work. He said it didn't work in Cuba. Mm-hmm. He said that kind, that kind of government control of the people can't work. It just doesn't work. And Cuba's the size of New York. So if it can't work in Cuba, how do we expect it to work here? And then he chastised on a job. I almost jumped up and cheered. You know, Fidel, you got hope, kid. Oh, I don't know. Maybe he's getting in roots, back to his roots of uh, and trying to ask for forgiveness because in case he goes and wants to get into heaven. <laughs> well, you know, he studied to be a priest at one time, so maybe he's got that in his background. <laughs> Castro, he's actually been a friend of the United States, but you know we just can't claim him as a friend because he's a communist. But you but know, you know I like I said I, I I don't want to I probably shouldn't even talk about this, but you know I always had a slight affection for Fidel. You know I thought he turned out the survivor. He was squeezed between everybody, and he never really bothered anybody. And he turned out to be a survivor. You know, and he got squeezed in the middle and just turned out to be a survivor and. Hold on. And now discussing somebody's beeping, and and now saying this doesn't work. I thought, you know, is this? Are people listening to this? Are they? Are they listening? It can't work there. It didn't work there. How's it going to work here? This is an even larger country. Mm. I personally think that the health care reform bill is a way for the federal government to get in every American business. Um, I, I oh, I think, I think so. That um, I think that's a, a Big Brother Act in the guise of the children and the elderly and the disabled. And, you know, they're they're getting everybody to vote for it. Like, yeah, it's going to be great. And then next thing you know, you're going to wake up one morning, this is going to be a socialist country, and everybody's going to be going, okay, well, you know, well, the people who um, don't want to work and stuff like that, they'll be happy. But entrepreneurs and, you know, business owners and people who are trying to, um, make something of themselves, it's going to be harder and harder and harder for them to do it. And we talked about this last week, you know, and it's, it's, no, this is not what we want. This is going against capitalism. And uh, I think the borders should be open between the United States and Canada and the United States and, and Mexico. But I think there should be regulations. You know, I think that you, if you want to work here, you, know, you should have a visa and you should have to, you know, pay these taxes and those taxes. If you want to live here, that's fine for a year or two, just like somebody comes over here from Europe, that's fine. If you want citizenship, you have to go through what your friend, Dolly, that you, that you were talking about from Mexico went through, and that's your citizenship. You know, I, you know, I, I, I don't understand what all the hubbub is in Washington about uh, Mexicans. No, they can't vote here, not unless they want to become citizens. If you want to come work here, get a visa. You know, mm-hmm. if you want to live here, get uh, not, there's a certain type of visa for that. Mm-hmm. But you're not a, you're you're not a, a citizen yet. You know, that's only good for a year, maybe two. They have student visas. They have all types of visas. We don't have yeah. any problem with Mexicans. I know a lot of Mexicans. They're hard ass workers. Mm-hmm. 
no problem with Mexicans whatsoever. Well, everybody coming across the border in Arizona is not Hispanic. When I was out there, and we see them coming across the backpacks, believe me, my late husband, God bless him, was an Arab American. I know an Arab when I see one. You know, so why are they coming across the border illegally? Are they trying to blend? Mm -hmm. Well, you see, that's the other thing. If a terrorist, you know, from um, Iraq or, well, not, not, I, 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 do we still have terrorists in Iraq? They don't talk about that on the news. Yeah, I, 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 I don't know. But wherever these terrorists come from, if they can get into Mexico and get into Canada, well, you know, if we just have open borders, well, what's to stop them from walking right across the, the border into here? But, you know, if we have regulations, you, you go to a city courthouse, you know, you got to walk through a medical detector. You get, you know, um, you have to have some sort of ID and stuff. But outside of that, I don't see any problems with Mexicans coming in here and going to work as long as they, you, you know, go through the process. Right. Go through. That's the perfect way to put it there, Cass. Yeah. Now, Cass, yeah. is that what you would do? You would you well, would seek yeah. to find some way to regulate it and, and well, make it viable? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, that would, do we have, there's a process in place, and most Americans really feel that way. It's not that they're – and that's why I don't want to make illegal immigration a racial or an ethnic issue – you know, it's a process issue. It's a status, you know. Uh, so basically we just need to start using the process. And, if, and I had this interview with the Dallas News at one point. I said, you know, we've got to look at the process. And if the process is broken, then we need to redefine or refine the process. You know, if we have certain quotas for a certain amount, or if we have backlogs or certain like this or, or visas for a certain type or whatever it may be, and you know, this is where President Bush kind of came in and tried to install an immigration policy that was worked on, on the process of getting people registered and getting them some visas and, and stuff along those lines, and they would work. And, you know, the, if there's a process in place, it's just use it. You know, when you, when you, you go the other direction, you're usually going to drive people to do, you know, very extreme actions. And does it so, take time? Yes, it does. It took Gazelle, yeah. well, let's see, it took her four years to get here. Mm -hmm. So it does take time, and sometimes if you really want something bad enough, you have to wait for that. And exactly. That. Exactly. And that's, that's why a lot of the Americans really support the process or want people to get used to the process. Or like know. France has guest worker program. Mm -hmm. Okay, you're coming in as a guest worker. You're not going to become a citizen. You exactly. don't have to be. You don't have to wait in line. You're a guest mm -hmm. worker. You come in and work and you go. And the concern there on the flip side of that is just to make sure that, you know, because sometimes you may have some American <coughs> citizens who are unemployed and they may not get the first, you know, bid at the uh, at the job. And we got to be able to protect the American worker as well. Well, on the flip side, I don't want Mexico to tell me I can't come to Tijuana and drink. Well, well, they can. <laughs> I mean, they can. But, I mean, yeah, I mean, they can, but, you know, I don't want that. I don't want to get stopped at the border and have them tell me, oh, you can't come in here because, you know, you're not a citizen. You know, as long as I have my ID and, you know, they, they can they can run my ID at the border and they, they know I'm not a terrorist, they know I'm not a uh, a felon, well, I can, I can go to Tijuana and drink. And then go That's home. exactly right. And you carry that identification on you and you can mm -hmm. prove who you are. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the idea you come across, you don't have to prove it. How dare you ask me for my ID? If I buy something, you know, I have to, if I use my charge card, you know, my debit card in the bank, you still have to have a driver's license. Mm -hmm. hey, we got we got 60 seconds left. Uh, right okay. before that, I'm going to play some music. Don't hang up. We can still talk after that. Okay. Now, okay. Uh, I guess if I want to say 60 seconds real quick, what I could probably use for any listeners out there, is we really want to get this campaign off the ground and uh, really soliciting donations at this point. Anything you can give would really kind of, uh, kind of put this movement in the right direction to where we ourselves can uh, can take back our country. And that's basically what it's all about. So go for And it does take money to run a campaign. You yeah. have to have it. So CASPERSENATE.COM, that's C-A-S-F-O-R, Senate.com. And you see the contribution page. You can go ahead and click on that, and, and we, can get, we can make a make some noise here in, in Texas. And you don't have to, you also don't have to be uh, a citizen of the state of Texas. You can be no. from anywhere. You do not have to be a Texan. You can be a legal resident of any other state in the U.S. Yes, you can be U.S. from Mexico. Oh, no, uh -huh. take donations from foreigners. <laughs> you can. Are you horny? <laughs> I'm a longhorn now. <laughs> i gotta figure out. I got to figure out where Houston stands there. Because they were in the top good. five or ten, I think. <laughs> but I first came All right, we're going to go. Thanks, everybody. All right, take care, Mike. Great job, guys.